Hello everyone and welcome back to your favorite show that takes high art and throws it into a sporting arena for our amusement. Today getting the thumbs up will be one of two diabolically deep directors that have combined for seven deadly sins, three Batman movies, and one glorious six pack. You do not talk about Fight Club. Shh, we don't, are we, am I not allowed to talk about the, I mean it's, anyway, it's Fincher versus Nolan. In one corner, you have the dark, authentic style of David Fincher. In the other, you have the thinking person's hitmaker in Christopher Nolan. And while Michael Caine will tell you there's three rounds to making a magic trick, on this show, there's four rounds to determine a winner. Round one, box office. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Round three, characters. And then we'll do a wild card round to settle the score. Pick a card, any card. Could be an ace, a jack, or a joker. That's my, that impression wasn't the right joker, was it? Well, let's get it on. Why would you do that? Some men just want to watch the world burn. Round one, box office. Good news, Fincher fans. There's other rounds you can win. Pace yourselves because, look, this Nolan guy, he teamed up with that bad fella, not one, not two, but two and a half times. I really don't like the second half of The Dark Knight Rises. Impossible. And those flicks crush at the box office. Now Fincher usually makes R-rated movies, so even if kids wanted to see one, they'd buy a ticket for something else before sneaking in. I'm just saying anything is possible. Maybe this Davy can beat Goliath in the world of cinematic dollar churning. After all, Fincher is no slouch when it comes to his turning of celluloid into bullion. Relying on the strength of critically acclaimed films like Seven and The Social Network, David Fincher's career earnings as a director total $1.3 billion domestically and $3.3 billion worldwide for an international average of $329 million. Quite the accomplishment, though not wholly unexpected for a guy who cut his teeth in the effects department for industrial light and magic blockbusters such as Return of the Jedi and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Speaking of directors, I think that Lucas fella, he's going places. Right. But you could combine all the money on Earth and on Fury 161, and it still wouldn't be enough to topple Nolan. Dude has been lighting up the scoreboard for almost two decades to the tune of $2.52 billion and $5.87 billion over the globe, making for a per flick average of $653 million when it's all said and done. That's in no small part thanks to Robin's big brother, Bruce. The Batman movies have combined for $3.1 billion across the world, averaging just over a bill each time Christian Bale puts on that suit and does that funny thing with his voice. Nolan's all-time highest grossing film that's not centered in Gotham City is Inception with $1 billion internationally, and Fincher can also afford a house in that neighborhood as his best effort is seven, with $703 million worldwide. So, yeah, it's fair to say Fincher would have a shot in this category, if not for the Batman. But I saw those movies, so did you. They're based off a comic book, and they're great. At least the first two. Okay, I'll lay off. Fincher's back is not broken yet, but Christopher Nolan does win the round and takes a 1-0 lead. Man's reach exceeds his imagination. <laughs> round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Here's where Fincher has a shot. He's been making critical darling films ever since directly after Alien 3, and the fact that audiences show up to see them is icing on the spaghetti. Alien 3 gathered a rotten 44% in 1992, but David quickly rebounded in 95 as 7 nabbed at 81% fresh, and his films and TV have been fresh ever since. Yes, TV counts. Mindhunter, Love, Death, and Robots, that all counts if we're sticking with movies. Fincher reached his tomato meter peak with The Social Network, getting a Harvard-approved 96% fresh. A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? You. His overall average is a very healthy 78%, but I look, it's a bad signal. Yeah, no one's Batman trilogy is 88.3% fresh, and his overall resume, it averages a mind-boggling 86%. You ought to know, you bought it. That includes early films like 2000's Memento and his most recent release, Come On, Tenet, Get Here, Dunkirk, both of which are at 93%. Every movie Nolan has directed is fresh. I believe it's actually certified fresh since following. And he also gets credit on Man of Steel, which it... 
It's rotten? Ah, oh, at 56%. So close. I guess the S on Superman's chest stands for meh. If you combine these guys' resumes and form a top 10 tomato meter list, it reads like a who's who of the most celebrated films post-2000. There's Inception at 87%, and right next door is Gone Girl. Insomnia at 92%, and speaking of creeps, Zodiac is in there with an 89%. No one is up for the moment with the critics, but how does the audience feel about these fellas? Uh, they're fans. With Nolan, his average audience score is a stellar 88%, Meanwhile, Fincher also stays fresh with an 80%. I gotta think this is where the directorial style and choices really factor in. Fincher loves to deal with very dreary subject matter. If Edgar Allan Poe or Emily Dickinson were around today, and they might be, Fincher would be their favorite director. Nolan can go dark too, but when darkness is ensconced with the most famous hockey pad critic ever, audiences might tend to resonate a little bit more. Fincher's best audience score is 96% for Fight Club, while Nolan's trio of Memento, Batman Begins, and The Dark Knight each got him his best effort at 94%. Fincher has woken up and gave a sterling effort in round two, but so far it's Nolan's game. He wins the round, and now David Fincher fans are starting to panic. Room. It's a m Let's move on. Uh, uh, I thought my jokes were bad. Round three, character. Uh, breaking news into the show, if you're making a movie, you are required to have compelling characters. Or at least you should be. Uh, you need to know what makes a great character? Ask David Fincher or Christopher Nolan. They've been making movies with epic parts from memorable performers for almost a combined five decades. Now, let's see who did it the best. Christopher Nolan certainly had help when it came to his blockbuster comic book flicks. Joker, Catwoman, Batman, and Bruce Wayne who is totally not any of the names I just mentioned, they were already fleshed out in the picture books for over a half century before Nolan got his talented hands on them. But I will give him credit for elevating the stature of all superhero flicks to follow. <laughs> After The Dark Knight, it was possible to get nominated and even win an Academy Award for playing a role in those kind of movies. Before Nolan, franchises like Batman had become a joke, no pun intended. They were nothing more than an easy well to sell toys and get us collector cups at the drive-thru. And for the shred of criticism Nolan has received for a piece like Dunkirk, which audiences showed up to watch, even though it's artsy, look, there weren't any memorable characters, I'd counter that with the fact that, yeah, I can't recall their names, but wow did I care about them while I was watching the movie. My spoiled self couldn't figure out whether to shove another fist of popcorn down my gullet or duck for cover. And if we're really searching for great characters in one of Christopher Nolan's movies, look no further than Matthew McConaughey's Cooper in Interstellar. Why are you whispering? They can't hear you. Guy Pierce's Leonard in Memento, or any of the times Michael Caine has graced us with his regal presence. Inception brought it to another level with a badass team of dream-chasing experts. But it's what Nolan did with Robin Williams that might be the most impressive. In Insomnia, he managed to create a world where arguably the funniest, most beloved human in history became a deranged, murderous psychopath. It's thrilling until the end, and it's because you buy into the characters. She's terrified. She's screaming her head off. I put my hand over her mouth. <laughs> and, and then I'm, I'm really scared. I'm like, yeah, I'm scared shitless. That's a lesson David Fincher certainly learned early on. After being thrown into Alien 3 amid rewrites and firings, he could have easily relied on the heroic Ellen Ripley and the evil Queen Xenomorph to the point of overkill. But he didn't. He instead gave us a prison cell of remarkable ne'er-do-wells led by the incomparable Charles S. Dutton as Dylan. Now, sure, most of that movie is bad effects and closing garage doors on aliens, but it's the characters and the performances that Venture got from his thespians that made Alien 3 a film that, some will say, isn't all that bad. Dare we say it's a rotten movie we love? I don't have a uh, copy of the book here. Wait, wait, what? Really? What the f- Well, let's get real. You can't ever shake the creeps that one gets from the cast of Seven and Zodiac, and if it's characters you want, the social network is the super highway you should take. Fleshing out the enigmatic Mark Zuckerberg, Edwin, Sean Parker, and the Winklevi is no easy task. Yet it was them, even more so than the story of Facebook, that we all rushed to social media to rave about after the credits rolled. Yes. 
And when we all went to go see Gone Girl, who could have guessed that Rosamund Pike's Amy Dunn would have given us so many twists, turns, and chills, unless you cheated and read the book first. Yeah, you heard me. Reading is cheating. One might say that Brad Pitt would be Fincher's muse, as he's appeared in four films, and we know at least two of his characters by name alone. Who hasn't made a Benjamin Button reference? At this point, I think most people think Benjamin Button was like a real guy who aged backwards, not just a weird old baby in a movie. And the other one, Tyler Durden? Yeah, not only was Tyler not real, he was so imaginary, he entered into all of our minds and gave us one of the most enduring characters in cinematic history. I started three Fight Clubs myself since seeing the movie. And now I must resign from all three Fight Clubs. Which means a lot of you have been breaking the first two rules of Fight Club. But hey, it's not all bad news. David Fincher, you've won the character round and you cut the lead to one. We got us a ball game, folks. We should do this again sometime. <laughs> Wild card round, iconic moments. Whether it's floating in a dreamscape hallway or finally finding out what's in the box, both Fincher and Nolan have made their mark on cinema thanks in large part to the iconic moments they've created. And if you've never seen Seven, I won't tell you uh, what was in the box. Goop! Actually, it was kind of a goop product. You lie! Christopher Nolan can weave something remarkable regardless of the budget he has to play with. That much was evident as soon as we see Cobb disappear in Chris's feature debut, following. He'd follow that up with a tremendous tension build in Memento. That classic chasing trope thrown on its ear because we don't know if Guy Pearce is doing the chasing or is being chased. And if you want compelling chase sequences, throw two iconic actors into a fog and voila. Doesn't matter that they're going slower than Michael Myers with a bum ankle. There's a fog, kids! Nolan, with a budget, just takes it to another level entirely, in a move that would be replicated by the MCU, placing a giant comic book franchise in the hands of a director who cut his teeth in the independent world of storytelling paid dividends. We get the Dark Knight bank robbery and the heist in China. We also get Nolan himself's favorite sequence with the IMAX-friendly plane jump in The Dark Knight Rises. That dude can wow us with movies that are one long iconic scene, like Dunkirk and also subvert our expectations simply by spinning a top in Inception. Also, after those nightmarish elevators in that movie, I refuse to get on an elevator of any sort for like a year. I will take the stairs. Thank you very much. Taking the escalator to the iconic moment Hall of Fame is David Fincher. Alien 3? I'm not going to lie to you. It's, uh... But hey, Seven had intense, memorable images of each of the deadly sins. We all saw that, and we're creeped out, and we didn't trust anything anymore, and we were still shocked by that ending. I didn't open a box for like a year after that. <laughs> These movies really affect me. Fincher has the unique talent of even making a conversation in a bar memorable. Watching Jake Gyllenhaal and Tony Stark slowly piece together the Zodiac Killer's clues is captivating. And when Sean Parker is selling himself to Mark Zuckerberg, we're all buying in too. Just Facebook. It's cleaner. And while Fincher didn't choose to go the route of Christopher Nolan with a resilient superhero series, he still managed to get iconic moments out of every single movie he crafted. The torture scene in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is disturbing and unforgettable, as is the car accident in Benjamin Button. And in Panic Room, the break-in scene feels so authentic, you feel like it's your house that's being robbed. Uh, seriously, I didn't break into a house for like a year after that. And I don't want any help from Joe Pesci over here. But if all else is equal in this round, I can't help but give the tiebreaker to Fincher simply because he is relentless with not allowing the audience to get ahead of him. We're always pulling a Def Leppard because we're two steps behind. Or in Michael Douglas's case, 20 steps behind. His character in the game is all of us watching every Fincher movie. We start out feeling cocky, feeling prepared. <laughs> I've been to the movies before. I got this. How does this work? And before the second act even starts, we're helpless putty in his masterful hands, bending to his will until the very end when we can't believe the soap guy was imaginary the whole time? Really? But those abs were real. I'm giving Fincher the W in the wildcard round, and guess what? We're all tied up at 2-2. Two to two. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place, 
and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. So it's a tie. We'll all shake hands and say good game. Yeah, if only competition was that simple. I gotta declare a winner before I unleash all you loyal viewers onto the comment section to weigh in yourselves. So anytime I have to make a decision this tough, I go to my thinking room. My own personal cerebro. And while I was sitting on the toilet, I happened upon a great piece by our own Mark Hoffmeyer. He ranked the Nolan Batman franchise as the second best action series ever, trailing only Mad Max. And that was published right here at Rotten Tomatoes, the link is in the bio. Written in 2019, which was 30 years ago. So I'll simply add that not only are those movies epic, they saved Batman and the future of superhero movies forevermore. We don't get Iron Man, or Joker, or Socket Boy, or whatever new comic book flick is next unless Nolan gives us his take on the Cape Crusader. You think Bruce had a tough time climbing out of that hell pit with a broken back? Try resurrecting Batman after Mr. Freeze and company put him on ice. Uh, that's my exit cue. However, my one small gripe with Nolan is that he doesn't always stick the landing. The Dark Knight Rises, it ended up feeling like it was ripped out of Batman 1966. And if you liked it, great. I wish I did. I wish all bone breaks would heal after five days. But Interstellar also meandered to the finish line. Again, it certainly has its fans. But one could argue that the best Nolan ending ever is the open-ended one at the denouement of Inception. Okay, look, like I said, Guy's a legendary director. I'm just giving a tiny comment. There's no point being coy. Fincher, on the other hand, does a 10 out of 10 routine and then closes with a flourish. Even his lesser appreciated movies have endings that add up to more than the sum of their parts. And for that, I'm giving David Fincher the win over Christopher Nolan. That's right, the guy who made Alien 3 has defeated the guy that saved comic book movies forever. Oh no, what have I just done? Hey, see Tenet in theaters! It's not time travel, it's clock manipulation! If I could pull a share and turn back time, maybe I'd give Nolan the win today. But I can't, I have stuff to do, promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep. Hey, we can't all age like Benjamin Button. Here's a reminder to comment in the section below and cast your vote. Nolan, Fincher, it's you. You're the real winner today. I'm Mark Ellis, and I'm just a figment of your imagination. See you on your dreams.